This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. Chapter 17 Cut Offs and Stephen. These dry details are of importance in one particular. They give me an opportunity of introducing one of the Mississippi's oddest peculiarities, that of shortening its length from time to time. If you will throw a long, pliant apple-paring over your shoulder, it will pretty fairly shape itself into an average section of the Mississippi, that is, the nine or ten hundred miles stretching from Cairo, Illinois, southward to New Orleans, the same being wonderfully crooked, with a brief straight bit here and there, at wide intervals. The two hundred mile stretch from Cairo northward to St. Louis is by no means so crooked, that being a rocky country which the river cannot cut much. The water cuts the alluvial banks of the lower river into deep horseshoe curves, so deep, indeed, that in some places, if you were to get ashore at one extremity of the horseshoe and walk across the neck, half or three-quarters of a mile, you could sit down and rest a couple of hours while your steamer was coming round the long elbow at a speed of ten miles an hour, to take you aboard again. When the river is rising fast, some scoundrel whose plantation is back in the country, and therefore of inferior value, has only to watch his chance, cut a little gutter across the narrow neck of land some dark night, and turn the water into it, and in a wonderfully short time a miracle has happened. To wit, the whole Mississippi has taken possession of that little ditch, and placed the countryman's plantation on its bank, quadrupling its value, and that other party's formerly valuable plantation finds itself away out yonder on a big island, and the old water-course around it will soon shoal up, boats cannot approach within ten miles of it, and down goes its value to a fourth of its former worth. Watches are kept on those narrow necks at needful times, and if a man happens to be caught cutting a ditch across them, the chances are all against his ever having another opportunity to cut a ditch. Pray observe some of the effects of this ditching business. Once there was a neck opposite Port Hudson, Louisiana, which was only half a mile across in its narrowest place. You could walk across there in fifteen minutes, but if you made the journey around the Cape on a raft, you travelled thirty-five miles to accomplish the same thing. In 1722 the river darted through that neck, deserted its old bed, and thus shortened itself thirty-five miles. In the same way it shortened itself twenty-five miles at Black Hawk Point in 1699. Below Red River Landing, Recursi cut-off was made, forty or fifty years ago, I think. This shortened the river twenty-eight miles. In our day, if you travel by river from the southernmost of these three cut-offs to the northernmost, you go about seventy miles. To do the same thing a hundred and seventy-six years ago, one had to go a hundred and fifty-eight miles, shortening of eighty-eight miles in that trifling distance. At some forgotten time in the past, cut-offs were made above Vidalia, Louisiana, at Island 92, at Island 84, and at Hales Point. These shortened the river, in the aggregate, seventy-seven miles. Since my own day on the Mississippi, cut-offs have been made at Hurricane Island, at Island 100, at Napoleon, Arkansas, at Walnut Bend, and at Council Bend. These shortened the river, in the aggregate, sixty-seven miles. In my own time a cut-off was made at American Bend, which shortened the river ten miles or more. Therefore the Mississippi between Cairo and New Orleans was twelve hundred and fifteen miles long one hundred and seventy-six years ago. It was eleven hundred and eighty after the cut-off of 1722. It was one thousand and forty after the American Bend cut-off. It has lost sixty-seven miles since. Consequently, its length is only nine hundred and seventy-three miles at present. Now, if I wanted to be one of those ponderous scientific people, and let on to prove what had occurred in the remote past by what had occurred in a given time in the recent past, or what will occur in the far future by what has occurred in late years, what an opportunity is here! Geology never had such a chance, nor such exact data to argue from, nor development of species, either. Glacial epochs are great things, but they are vague, vague. Please observe. 
in the space of one hundred and seventy-six years the lower mississippi has shortened itself two hundred and forty-two miles that is an average of a trifle over one mile and a third per year therefore any calm person who is not blind or idiotic can see that in the old oolitic silurian period just a million years ago next november the lower mississippi river was upwards of one million three hundred thousand miles long and stuck out over the gulf of mexico like a fishing rod and by the same token any person can see that seven hundred and forty two years from now the lower mississippi will only be a mile and three quarters long and cairo and new orleans will have joined their streets together and be plodding comfortably along under a single mayor and a mutual board of aldermen there is something fascinating about science one gets such wholesale returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of fact when the water be